want to say welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is another pitch battle. Uh, we're a food and beverage theme this time. We're partnering with Metro Collective. Uh, for those who have attended these before, uh, thanks for coming back. And we've got a great batch of startups here. For those that this is new, hope you, you enjoy. I'm going to share my screen, just go over a few of the logistics here before we do some intros and get, get the ball rolling. Quick promo for the Startup Grand Global Conference. If anyone is interested, uh, you know, please reach out. That's next week. Uh, happy to get uh, people set up. Um, we're actually going to give away uh, a prize today for the, the winner of this pitch battle. Um, if we have some extra tickets, be happy to help out folks in the community that are you know actually able and have the you know will have the capacity to attend. But I again want to kick things off. Want to say thanks to our partner uh, Metro Collective and. More that you meet in a second. It's been great in helping out, uh, coordinate and promote the, this event. We've been doing a lot of outreach to the local food and beverage startups here. I also want to say thanks to uh, our sponsor, Launch New York, which is uh, an, a local investment and accelerator program for uh, startups here in Rochester, New York. So if you're interested, feel free to reach out. We can definitely get you in touch with some of the resources there. As far as the event tonight, we're going to go through the logistics. Uh, we have some great judges. Uh, we have Maureen, Laura, and Terrell. I want to make sure they each get a second to uh, introduce themselves uh, so everyone has a chance to meet them before we uh, go to the judges. During the pitch competition uh, between each presentation, there are going to be the ones asking some of the Q&A that you guys will be able to see. So bear with me for a second as I start adding these people to the screen. But if we could have each judge do a quick uh, say hello. Um, that would be great. And we'll, we'll move on to the, the rest of the agenda. Uh, Maureen and Laura. Marie, go ahead if you have the access. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Maureen Bellatori. Um, I wear a number of hats uh, today. My hat is um, with both 29 Design Studio and Metro Collective. 29 is a food, beverage, and agriculture focused creative agency. So primarily our work is focused on brand growth, brand strategy, um, brand development, that sort of thing. Um, we actually just won a couple of awards from the National Agri-Marketing Competition that was published in today's RBJ. Very exciting. Um, and then for Metro Collective, that is a collection of people, spaces, and ideas that are all united together under one single umbrella, but it's primarily shared spaces in and around the greater Rochester area, including uh, the building at 350 East Avenue in downtown Rochester, uh, former home of Metro Cowork, which is now going to be the future home of another co-working space. And so look forward to telling you all more about that very soon. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Can't, Laura, we can't hear you. After a year of this, right? <laughs> Not from you. Uh, this, this is Laura Fox O'Sullivan. I'm with the Commissary, which is the food business incubator located in the Sibley building. Um, the last time I was involved with one of these, it was, I think, probably one of the last in-person work events I went to, right? Like at early March of 2020. Um, and at that point, this, the, the Commissary was under construction on the first floor of the Sibley building. We are open. We've been open since October. Um, we are a great space for people who are looking to launch or legitimize a food business. Um, we are going to be launching a workshop series uh, very soon that is food specific. So Maureen, you and I should probably speak at some point uh, <laughs> about some ideas. 
and um, I'm looking forward to hearing about uh, what the um, the founders have to say today. And if anybody has any questions about the commissary, I'm happy to answer them in the chat or uh, shoot me an email, laura at rddc.org. Thanks for having me, Michael. Awesome. Thank you. And I'm not sure we got Pharrell here yet, so we're going to move forward and we might jump back to let him do a quick uh, intro when, he, when he's able to attend. So the format that we have here today, uh, we're going to, we basically just went through a, the intros with our judges, but the pitches themselves, each startup's going to have five minutes to do their presentation. They'll be presenting to us and uh, the judges. There'll be a three minute Q and A. So that's where the judges will come back on screen and be able to ask some questions based on you know what the presentation was. And then we'll have a quick transition. Uh, so a little two minute break. This is really for you know the next startup that's in line to kind of get their screen ready and work through if we still have any technical kinks um, to help them out on that. Once we get through that, we'll have you know five presentations. We'll go into a judge's deliberation. So we'll probably open up the uh, the room here for the founders to kind of take some Q&A from you guys directly. And then uh, the judges will sneak off and do a, another digital room to do a quick scoring. We'll come back hopefully in a few minutes uh, to announce you know, the winners and celebrate you know, our, our champion for the day. Uh, real quick, you know, we're doing these presentations and the judges will be having to come up with a winner. So how are we scoring them? Uh, we're using a quick, you know, one to 10 scale for three dimensions. One is the value proposition. Then we're, we'll, we'll be looking at the market opportunity. So kind of what's the size of the prize and then the pitch clarity, right? So how does each founder uh, position their product and, you know, the unmet need that their product's solving, you know, how much, you know, do we, can they kind of prove to the judges that they're, they're in a position to kind of capture that market and grab that market share. So with that being said, uh, we'll, move forward and announce the you know the prizes that we're going to have so everyone that joined we're going to get everyone uh set up startup grind does have a um a startup program so it provides mentorship access to in investors other founders um you know through their global organization so there'll be a membership there where there'll be uh, you know some a year's worth of programming that you'll have access to and that network we're also going to give the winner a ticket to the global conference you saw the promo of that was um, it's actually happening next week. Uh, we will give the winner a startup grind hoodie. Uh, so you could show your pride local here in Rochester. Uh, we'll also get a meeting with uh, one of the WeFunder venture partners. So WeFunder is an equity crowdfunding platform. So you can actually tap into your community to uh, help you know, raise funds. And then the uh, last uh, item here that we added was a uh, local uh, serial entrepreneur, Martin Babnick, uh, has published a book called More Good Jobs. So very focused on building his communities and growing uh, our, our region here. So we're going to provide a digital version of that to the winner as well. All right, now that we know the format and what everyone's playing for, uh, we're going to introduce the startups. This will be the order uh, that we go through the pitches today. So as we tee up each um, startup, I'm going to can be flipping on uh, the screen. So again, I'm going to announce <laughs> Courtney and Chloe. Uh, I'm going to start getting you ready and get your cameras ready. So uh, once we uh, get you set up on the screen, I will uh, get you kicked off. Again, we'll we'll do the five minute queue uh, from once you guys start presenting. Right, let us know when. I'm going to stop sharing right now. <laughs> and you guys should have access. I'll drop myself off as far as the presentation is. Well. We doing the timer or no? We are you just going to tell it like the big timer on I, the screen? I I will verbally tell you when you guys got 30 seconds left. We have a timer too, so it's fine. <laughs> but thank <Okay>. you. <laughs> All right, I'm going to uh, turn my my screen off so you guys have the, the full screen. Here. Okay. Okay. All right, so. Should we share screen now? Wait, so we can oh, introduce. Okay. So is it started? 
You can. You should be able to share your screen now. Okay, we're gonna introduce ourselves real quick, and then source time starts. All right. So I'm Chloe Smith. I'm the faculty director, and we are going to this screen. I think it's this one, right? Yeah. Yep. Share and then this. Okay. Cool. All right. Can you all see the slides? Okay. All right, so uh, we are 490 Farmers. Um, we are a community garden and urban farm in the Pearl Megs Monroe neighborhood, sort of near the South Wedge. Um, so I'll just give a little spiel about our bigger mission and then kind of go into the history and the background of what um, the project has been about. So the planet is growing more food than ever, and yet millions of people continue to go hungry. People are hungry everywhere, in the country and in the suburbs. But increasingly, one of the front lines in the war against hunger is in, the, is in the cities. As urban populations grow, more people find themselves in food deserts, areas with limited access to supermarkets, grocery stores, or other sources of healthy and affordable food. And unfortunately, the city of Rochester has no shortage of food deserts. The financial link between community members and access to food and organizations such as ours is, are the future of the food system with an overarching emphasis on food sovereignty versus system dependency. So I'll just talk a little bit about the history of our project, um, kind of how it got started. So as the founder, um, this basically started in the fall of um, 2017. And I had just kind of come back from a trip um, where I stayed on a community farm um, where I was traveling for about six weeks in the summer. and this project was sort of the inspiration um, for the Foreign New Farmers project. So kind of when I came back from this um, travel, from this trip and this experience, I, um, I was in Rochester, I was living right near the garden um, in the Lock 66 neighborhood, which is um, kind of near, it's right next to Pearl Megs. Um, and I just was, I was walking past this spot kind of every day on the way to where I was working. And I just, um, I was kind of feeling like a lack of community in my life at the time and sort of feeling like um, kind of a lack of um, purpose and just wishing that I had sort of um, a similar um, community project like I had when I was at this um, farm stay. So I kind of was thinking as I was walking past this space, like how could this vacant lot become more of a community space and how do I turn this kind of, how can, as a community, can we turn this into um, a community project and a community garden. So I kind of reached out to some people that I knew about how to get going on it. And so we kind of um, were pointed in the right direction. We actually um, met with um, a group called the Urban Ag Working Group, which is an urban group of- um, hey, Courtney, I'm I'm in. Sorry to interrupt, yep. we lost your screen share. Oh, oh no. Hmm. We're seeing a web browser, but not actual slides. How about now? It says I'm still sharing. Because you are sharing your screen share. Let's try again. Okay. Now your screen share. Go to application window. Okay. How about now? Can you see anything now? We are seeing our we were seeing your web browser again with the screen in it. How about now? We got a white screen. Oh my gosh. Um, something to do with. Now you see nothing, right? You just see us? <laughs> yeah, the main prize. Um, yeah, we are the main prize. Um, all right, so Chloe, you want to just, I'll try to fudge around with it. Um, Here, look at, look at, look at. Because that's, don't do that. Don't Click do that. this window. Sure, sure. And then. We didn't do this yet. Should, yeah. But it's going to share this same seat. It needs to be this window that it's sharing. Oh, oh so here, share. share. Is it sharing now? No, see, it's still them. Share? No. Oh, we see a PowerPoint now. You see this? <laughs> yes, I see yearly stats on okay, the right, cool. Okay, I'm not gonna make it bigger than the team. When I make it bigger, okay. So just leave it like this. Yep, and then just go to your one or where you were. Okay, we'll go back um, to kind of like the about us. So um, 
So yeah, the, uh, we kind of got started in the fall of 2017, and now six months later, we have kind of met with uh, a bunch of um, the neighbors, and we went to some of the neighborhood association meetings, and we um, sent in a project proposal to the DOT, who were the there are landlords of the space there, were like state-owned land. So we sent in a project proposal, we got approved, and by 2018. Um, the start of the season, we um, were ready to go and we, we just started the garden. So um, so here's year one. This was um, spring of 2018. We started with a vacant plot of land. It's about a third of an acre. Um, and we transformed it into um, 10, I think 10 or 15 plots at the time that neighbors rented um, and they started to grow their gardens there. We started our uh, free food forest and we put up um, a little free pantry and we built a shed with rainwater catchment system. And we logged probably about 1200 volunteer hours from our neighbors and from ourselves. And we produced about 20 pounds of food for donation um, the first year. And the second year, uh, we already were growing, or we grew quite a bit. The second year, we got a grant from the Greater Rochester Health Foundation for $8,000. And we were able to build a bunch of beds. So we grew to 40 plots that year. We added our children's garden, um, a gathering space with picnic tables, a bunch of fruit trees, berry bushes, and uh, we produced a lot more food that year. That was 2019. And that brings us to last year, 2020, which was our biggest year yet. We had the most interest in the garden yet. So we have um, 50 garden plots now um, with a growing wait list. We have about 10 people on our wait list for class. And um, we have a beehive now, we have a flower farm. We have a little memorial garden um, and a composting setup, and we host weekly volunteer nights, um, workshops all summer and spring, and um, we hosted a, a farmer's market pilot event last fall, um, and we produced a lot more food this year and served quite a bit more, um, quite a few more families this year. So that kind of brings us to where we are now. So I'll let Courtney talk about um, where we're headed. Hi everybody, I'm Courtney Clay, I'm the executive director, so we are now in present time. So as you can see, Chloe has been a scrapper, she's been super amazing, she took a dream and she made it reality, and that's what we need in Rochester. So um, since Chloe is super great at the organizer and the grassroots, she brought me on to kind of do the business side. So year four, 2021 began, um, we got a 501c3 status in June 2021. We officially have four staff and a 11 member working board. Um, this year we're going to do four new programs and this is where you guys come in. We have, we're going to officially do the um, Garden District Farmers Market. We're doing a 490 food share program, which is a food box subscription for low income families. We're having a paid student intern through School Without Walls, which we're going to teach them, a, you know, how they can eventually become the founder or, you know, an executive director of something in their own neighborhood. And then we have community-led composting initiatives so we can have everyone see the whole cycle from fruition of seeds to where you know our food goes. Um, this year we wrote a grant and we are going to get water so the city is installing a water hydrant so now our irrigation system we can produce a lot more food and feed a lot more people. Um, our 2021 goals, we want to acquire a sustainable source of revenue um, that is not relying on grants. Hello, angel investors, all of you are lovely. <laughs> so right now we have an annual budget of, uh, basically year to date we've raised $4,000, so we'd love to be at 50000 so we can get an office space, we can pay staff a living wage, that's a huge priority for us. We want to help black and brown families in our neighborhood, as well as just low-income families, um, pay a living wage for the work that they're doing. And finally, um, how are we going to do all this? with hopefully an angel investor, we can grow, share, and learn. So how will we grow? By using our existing garden space to its fullest potential. We are um, branding and sorting vacant garden plots and beds across the city and growing spaces in urban farming education. We believe access to fresh food should not be dependent on your zip code. Um, and we are going to share. We will use our urban agriculture knowledge to offer free education programs and hands-on workshops to community members with on with age appropriate programming to foster an interest in gardening, beekeeping and sustainability. We're gonna to continue to share our bounty with food pantries, uh, community members, and we would love to begin offering produce to local restaurants um, in line with growing urban on the table herbs, or you know, produce to people like Bobby's Barbecue, Zolberger, people that are right in the neighborhood. And finally, we're gonna do advocacy and learning. So that's our biggest pillar here is we're learning from our community that we reside in. 490 Farmers will be using our social media platforms and grassroots organizing approach to promote other community organizations and inform the public how to increase funding to farms and co-ops and how these who are able can, cap, can act to protect food security in our communities. So urban farms like ours are the future for the food systems and we hope you will join us. And back to what Chloe Second. said earlier. 
Yay. Um, back to what Chloe said earlier, we really want you to guys to understand that um, this is a food sovereignty versus system dependency. So somehow um, like a human right has been, you know, brought into food and we want everyone in our city to have access to food and their dreams can become a reality. So you can see 2017, that was the land that Chloe walked by every day in 2020, it's this beautiful urban space. Um, I think that's all we wanted to say. And basically up until now, um, we've had like no money. So we've done yes. everything <laughs> up until now and totally 100% volunteer. Community-based. Um, labor and donations, which are only a few, um, which are growing every year, but so far not not um, enough for what we need to do. So, so imagine if we had investors, mm -hmm. what we could do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you, that's time. Yeah. I'm going to bring our judges back up. Uh, great job, by the way. It, Thank you. <laughs> way to show everyone how to work through adversary. adversary. <laughs> In our professional life and, and during the presentation. Hey, All guys. Right. Great job. Thank you. So I, I especially... Go ahead, I especially guys. love to see when somebody can pivot from tech issues because it can be so derailing, but no, you guys no. did a great job. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more about how you plan to scale. Are you going to go into other regions? Are you looking for other plots? Talk about that a little bit, if you would. So we plan to scale by making this a model that everybody can use in each quadrant. So again, people come to us all the time and say, what did you do? Well, <laughs> Chloe just asked. She said, how can I have this land? And that is it. Like literally we mm -hmm. can learn so much from Chloe. So we are gonna build this model and then build like a little kit and say, hey, you need this in the Southland. You need this. So we really wanna keep it Rochester based. But okay. again, this is a community led initiative. So on in turn with that, the reason, you know, people don't always see nonprofits as a revenue stream. Well, excuse my language, I swear everybody, um, we work our asses off and Chloe hasn't got paid in four years and that is all fine and well, we're not here for money, but we wanna bring back that holistic, like if you have a skill set, you deserve to be paid for it. I don't know about bees, right? I just know we needed a bee house and now we need to pay somebody to get those to bees to get those honey. So really that's what we wanna do here. We wanna get people who are, you know, understand what's going on this kit and say, okay, here, you need to talk to DOT like Chloe did, get insurance in. You know, insurance, you know how much money it costs to be there every year? Insurance is really expensive. Luckily, Chloe partnered with somebody and somebody carries our insurance. But not everybody knows all that, right? Mm -hmm. so we want to give that back to the community. Say, here's your little starter kit. We'll be supportive model, but start to finish, here's how you can grow it. And here's how Chloe grew. But as far as like expansion goes, like um, when we started, we definitely imagined this was like our first garden. And then eventually we'd spread kind of throughout the city and we'd have gardens throughout and we'd help others make it a little bit easier to start a garden with here um, with help from the city and bigger organizations. So, so like you see, yeah. Chloe didn't have water for four years and she made it work. Here for people to want to do. Great, thank you. Um, so Chloe, right, we've met before, if you remember. Yes, oh my God, you yeah. gave us um, I gave the you a roof. bunch of dirt. <laughs> oh my god, I don't see you and I know that's crazy. But no, no, no. I mean, I obviously I love I mean, I love this idea. I live in the South Wedge. I too, you know, saw that plot for years. So um I'm already biased because I also benefit from turning off the of 490 and turning on to Megs to go home and seeing that it's this instead of what it used to be. Um I also know that as you just mentioned, it's D it was DOT owned land, right? And I know mm -hmm. this is such a nitty gritty question and I'm not, I, I, I just happen to know a lot about this project. Um, and so that was almost like an easy win in the fact that it was like an easement from the old Erie Canal bed. So yep. um, I, I have several questions, but I'll start with this one. Do you have other big plots like that identified throughout the city? I understand that your model is to empower other quadrants, but um, are there are there other spaces that you see where you could replicate this and might even also have built around that that plot of land um the community will to do something like this so actually we're um this year we're planning to expand um a little bit onto the parcel next to us the larger parcel um so we've talked to the dot and the city who has plans to um to build on that land in the future, but they're saying that we can use it for now, like until that's gonna happen. So I think two years from now, 
Um, so that's gonna happen this year. And then also um, we've been talking to the DOT. They also own a parcel on Circle Street, which kind of um, goes up behind the Hungerford. It's like where Circle and East Main meet. Yeah. The, where the railroad. Yeah. So we've talked to them a little bit about that. Um, and then there's one spot sort of near the Beachwood neighborhood where I live, which I'm kind of eyeing and looking into that. I know like the um, the landlord of, of that property. So I, we're kind of have like our eye on a few different spots. Um, we're also working with Taproot Collective and they have connections with like the um, Market View Heights neighborhood and they're looking at a bunch of um, city owned parcels within that neighborhood. So hopefully, yeah, we're gonna kind of expand throughout in those those areas. And I'm looking right on top of us. So like that's how the relationship with Baber got very strong. Baber AME has that whole lot across the street from us, abandoned house. We're actually looking into re rehabbing that house with them and making that a community space so that we have an office space because we don't have that. So therefore we can't be here year round. And then we've identified with School Without Walls a partner. So they're like some of their land, they will give, yeah. you know, not give because we've been talking about holding events there and it'll be like a, so we've been, those partnerships are going to be huge and crucial with our growth within that space as we outgrow that corner. So then a second question that I have is. Um, and the last have, one, sorry, Laura. Okay. But Maureen, go ahead, ask it, ask burning, it. burning. No, go ahead. Okay. Ask it, ask so, um, my understanding, um, and 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 it seemed like the presentation bolstered this, is that the a, a lot of your business plan is renting plots out, right, to neighborhood residents. Um, mm -hmm. So, so explain to us the growth plan for how it's. Um, an interest in renting out plots, which is, you know, our, our what we have to provide is is land, and now you can utilize the land. But then also, um, there was a lot of talk about um, your five hundred one c three being able to sell to restaurants in the neighborhood. So, what is like the breakdown now, and then also moving forward between um, what you envision in terms of renting plots, and then is it? You know, Chloe, you taking the lead on um, farming certain plots and being able to provide that for um, restaurants and such. We actually have uh, we have a farm manager. So Chloe is the founder, and now she's moved on to the board. So she is the head of our board, and now we have four full time staff. Well, not full time. We have four staff that is working pro bono basically. Um, but we have a farm manager who's going to take on that. And then so with like the vendor, the farmers market, we have now a, a sponsor for the year. So that's how we're going to grow. So they gave us some money up front. And then because again, this goes back to community accessibility. The, the, we don't want people to improve prices so that we can you know, grow. So we're just going to be really creative. Um, so our vendors at the market, they're giving us $50, you know, for each space. So we're keeping it very small, but it can grow larger with, you know, keeping costs down. Do you have anything else to add about that part of it? So um, we have the plots and then we kind of separately have our CSA program, which we're starting this year, and then the food forest and the children's garden, like that's all separate from the plots. Mm -hmm. so the plots really make sense a half Very of small the project. Now. Okay. Right now. Michael, sorry. Yeah. One more question. One more question. Um, uh, you use the term angel investor. My world is also the 501c3 world. So um, how are you envisioning an angel investor? I mean, to me, the term would be like a, a donor or a, a sponsor. Um, mm -hmm. So can just for the sake of the audience, can you can you clarify that point? Yeah, absolutely. I have worked in the so my background is nonprofit and I know the vicious world that it can be, honestly, like for lack of a better word. Um, so I really, really, really don't want to take the brunt of us moving into 501c3 status away from all that. So I do, I do I would love to rely on a funder, I mean on an angel investor or somebody that can just give us unrestricted funding. Because every time I apply for a grant, I we have an eight thousand dollar grant coming in, there's no there's no money that can give back to 490 or to my staff. Right. So how so that's what I'm looking at, because as a grant, right, every grant I apply for, I have ten dollars left over to pay for staff, pay for us to run this. So that's why I would really, really love to get an angel investor or somebody to say, here, we believe in your mission. We watched you four years work for free. How can we then support that? Well, I would love to pay Chloe. I would love to pay my farm manager who, you know, has a GED fifteen dollars an hour because he doesn't deserve twelve, and that's kind of goes back to our mission. So I would love the idea to have unrestricted funding from somebody that believes in this project, so that when I continue to go after grants, I don't have to take away from that grant money to say, okay, I can give Chloe five dollars to her salary now. So that's what it is for me as a business. Under under understood, um, but investor I think implies. 
that mm-hmm. you you're making an investment and that you're mm-hmm. going to get um your money back and then some mm-hmm. but and that's mm-hmm. why i guess i um yeah i'm asking i agree on on a donation so i guess it's not an investor great. like you said donations. i want those that's yeah I, I guess like you said it's not there's there's really the investment to me is the investment in the community so i guess i'm using the wrong term but i come from a place of like I get capitalism, but I, I just think that like that should be them, the angel investor, getting their money back in fold as they continue to watch that abandoned building get built. Okay. So I guess in, like what you're saying, it is a donor, but I would love for someone to see the investment as a community getting ready. The best kind of donation. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where can I? Great up dialogue. Up? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think we Thanks, should continue guys. this after the next. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, girls. <laughs> I'm gonna. Oh, you need us. I'm gonna get Megan uh, set up so you guys. Uh, I'll start dropping you guys. Uh, Megan, I got your slides, but if you want to try to present, we'll give it a shot. Let's hope that it's actually working now. Okay, just for everyone to know, we actually did do like a tech run through last night, and we're just having all sorts of crazy issues now. Um, so let me see. I'm going to do my best. Let's go ahead and do this. Share. Ooh, awesome. Okay, great. I think you guys should be able to see it it's showing up on my screen. Um, but let me see if I go ahead and, uh, Michael, if you stay on for just a second, I'd love to see if I make this full screen, if you guys still see it. Are you guys able to see it? We are seeing it, and we're also seeing that in like presenting. Next slide. Right. All right, so, let me yeah. see. Okay, let me just do a quick swap, if you don't mind, please. Do, do, do. Let's see. And thanks for your patience. I appreciate it. Okay, you should. Okay, are you seeing a, a normal screen now? It's refreshing. Yeah, we're good now. Okay, so you just see the presentation. Yep. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay. Um, first of all, I just want to say shout out to 490 Farmers. I'm so inspired. I definitely want to learn beekeeping. So I would love to stay in the loop about that. But that's really, really exciting. Congrats to you guys. You're doing some amazing work. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start my timer, Michael, if you're ready. Okay, I'm starting. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Megan Mazin. I'm the founder of Bandita Horchata Cold Brew Coffee. And I'm so excited to tell you a little bit more about what inspired me to start my business. Uh, I was actually inspired very much by an afternoon like I had today. I was in the need of a beverage for a pick-me-up and I wanted something that had the caffeine and flavor I want, but free of the things I don't want, like double-digit grams of sugar, dairy, or other mystery ingredients. And more often than not, I'd find myself here somewhere like a deli, a grocery store, grabbing bottles flipping them over, reading the labels. And I know you've seen me or at least someone like me because over 41 million Americans are non-dairy coffee lovers and we don't have many, if any, options on shelves that aren't sugar bombs. And when it comes to sugar, sugar is more than a matter of preference. It's actually a matter of health because sugary drinks are usually a catalyst for diabetes, especially in minority populations. And Hispanics are twice as likely to have diabetes compared to non-Hispanic whites. And this statistic becomes more than a statistic for me. As you see in the bottom here, that's actually a picture I made my dad. You can see I was still rocking cool hats back in the day, but he actually does suffer from uh, pre-diabetes symptoms. And so this is really personal to me. Uh, so I set out on a mission to create something that is healthful, but also abuela approved, something that would resonate with the general market, but also Hispanic communities. And that's how I developed Bandita Horchata Cold Brew. Bandita makes deceptively dairy-free horchata cold brew coffee. And for those of you who don't know what horchata is, it's a Mexican beverage, one of my favorite childhood drinks. It's made with rice milk, cinnamon, vanilla, and some naughty but delicious ingredients like condensed milk and refined sugar and whole milk. And so Bandita was a reinvention of that. So Bandita says no gracias to dairy. It instead uses a blend of rice, cashew, and coconut milk. And we use dates rather than sugar, a refined sugar to go ahead and sweeten it. And Bandita only has nine grams of sugar compared to something like Starbucks ready to drink almond milk latte, which actually has 28 grams of sugar in it. And just to put that in perspective, that's more than a cupcake. Uh, and so Bandita is currently sold for $5 for a 10 ounce bottle. And we're also available in six packs. And so we really continue to win with customers and get repeat customers because we not only taste good, but we do good as well. Um, 
being a business owner is an absolute privilege and one I don't take lightly. So I think it's really important that we continue to build the world that we want to live in. And so Bandita does this by using coffee breaks to break the glass ceiling. And we do this by partnering with diverse women at every step of the process from our coffee growers and roasters to our social media strategists and accountant to help bring Bandita to life. Um, and this isn't something that only I care about. It's something our consumers actually are really passionate about as well. We call them our conscious coffee consumers. And they're, they're non-dairy coffee drinkers that are open to more helpful products and also have that social mindset. Um, so when we took a deep dive into this consumer, we see that she tends to be a little bit younger between the ages of 25 and 44 and found in markets like New York, Texas, California, and Florida. And when we get into her, some of her psychographics, she's really open to trying new products, especially those that align with her beliefs. Um, and then when it comes to behavior, she's drinking a lot of coffee and spending money on it when she actually goes out. And so using this combined, uh, the psychographics and coffee behavior combined, we see there's definitely an opportunity to steal some market share. And so just to put this all into a little bit more perspective, there are about 3 million conscious coffee consumers in New York metro area. And if we can get 1% of 1%, so 0.01% to even sample Bandita, that's selling 40,000 bottles. And I think we're really going to have an easy time at selling those 40,000 bottles because when we look at the competition, no one's really hitting on all three elements. No one's hitting on both the non-dairy milk, the helpful aspect of uh, a ready-to-drink coffee, as well as being mission-driven where Bandita is. And so taking a look at the last year, it's really been a, about prototyping and really doing a proof of concept. And even though we've been, we've launched essentially in the middle of a pandemic, uh, we've still seen pretty consistent growth and, and continual support from our customer base. And I'm a visual learner, so I love showing, showing some visuals of, of Bandita's progress in the last year. Uh, but on the on the far left, you'll see day one, the birth of Bandita, literally the first day I even thought of uh, Bandita and month one, moving along and seeing how it evolved and, and how we started updating our packaging in those first days of testing with customers in farmers markets, asking, do you prefer the pink cap or the white cap? Do you like the creamier version, the sweeter version? I always try to make a focus group. And then finally in year one, where we are now, evolving the packaging to be glass bottles as we heard from our customers, but also working with an R&D team to actually start commercializing the process and moving out of the small commercial kitchens and into a relationship with a co-manufacturer so we can really start to scale. Um, and so as I'm wrapping up, I would love to leave you guys with one quote, and that's from a customer. And our customer said, I'm buying a bottle for my 12-year-old daughter. I want her to know what is possible, that this product was made by women. Um, thank you guys so much. I'm really excited to pitch for you today and I look forward to hearing the results. Cool. Great timing as well. Thank you. I'm, I'm the judge's pet. Okay, great. Great presentation. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. I appreciate everyone being here today and, and tuning in. I think it's really amazing that we all come together to, to support uh, entrepreneurs, whether you're just a supporter or a fellow entrepreneur in yourself. So. Shout out to everyone. All right. Maureen and Laura, we should be getting you back up there. And I'll kick off, I'll start off the, third, the three minutes now. So feel free to get the QA going. Great. I went for first last time. Do you want to go first this time, Laura? Uh, sure. Megan, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm going to take up time doing this, but is it possible? Uh, maybe it's not possible to pull up the slide again. Yeah. But one of the questions that I have. Um, I mean, you have me, I am your demographic, Maureen is your demographic, sure. I drink too much coffee, I have two little kids, um, don't want to drink a lot of sugar, so I, I'm there. What I'm curious about is um, who your competitors are, right? You mentioned Starbucks, you're almost, you know, a third of the sugar, but that competitor slide that you showed, I'm yep. curious. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk a little bit about it. Yeah. So, when so, so, for instance, like La Colombe, I know. Mm -hmm. um, the other two, you know, would be helpful to know. Whatever, whatever it might be, I just, I just want to have a better understanding of your market. Absolutely. Well, I think the first thing to acknowledge is, of course, being being a beverage, we have direct competitors with, within the the non dairy coffee space, and we also have indirect competitors. So when you go to a cooler in a deli, you might be deciding between grabbing a water, grabbing a tea, and so I think in the back of my head, it's always really important to think about those those halo competitors. But our direct competitors 
competitors would sit somewhere in, in this um, Venn diagram you see here. So that would be our stump town, which has uh, like, uh, they have a couple different non-dairy coffees coming in like the little cartons ranging from a coconut cream one, which is very decadent and delicious, but maybe not an everyday drink, um, to being able to go and personalize your own drink at your local coffee shop or a Starbucks or a Dunkin', but maybe you're on the go, or maybe, um, you know, once starting you know next year when travel picks back up you maybe don't have time to say stop at the the local or not the local coffee shop but you maybe want to grab something on the go in the in the airport or things like that we've got our califia um, which is started with the larger formats of non-dairy milks and then started moving into the smaller um, coffee based options as well as chocolate milk which is of course also delicious um, and then uh, Sail Away is also someone who's kind of explored horchata as a flavor, but in uh, my product research uh, and customer research, it hasn't really performed from a flavor perspective. It's, it's not as creamy or the cinnamon and vanilla aren't as intense as, say, with a Bandita Horchata cold brew. Okay. Um, Maureen, do you want to ask an actual question that was more for me just clarifying? Yeah, can you go to your next slide that has your revenue projections? I'm curious. It's it's helped me understand a little bit more about where you are in your fate in your process right now. I mean, it's clear that you've listened to your customers. You've done a lot of iterations. Um, when are you when are you launching? Tell us a little bit more about some of the next notes. Absolutely. Yes. So right now, um, so I've had actually two separate uh, research and development phases. Uh, the and it, they both actually coincided like end of year. Um, but uh, the end of 2019 into 2020 was focusing on um, going out to Purdue, meeting with the scientists there, figuring out what type of like machinery are actually going to be needed, as well as what type of bottling technology. Um, and so I fast forwarded, did some additional like product development, again, trying to get really specific on what the recipe is going to be before I commit, you know, commit thousands and thousands of my hard earned cash into um, working with an R&D team and making sure we, we get the recipe right. Um, but overall, I've sold over a thousand bottles, um, and that's netted in a, a little over twenty thousand dollars in, or a little under thirty thousand, excuse me, in revenue um, this year. In addition to some merchandise sales and some general support, so I've also sell like um, hats and and Bandita merch as a whole, which has been really awesome to to see the community support in that way. Um, but it's been a really phenomenal experience. But again, it hasn't really launched commercially yet, and that's my goal for spring of twenty twenty one. So I'm currently in the midst of r and I'm actually getting some samples hopefully on Saturday from my R&D team. Um, I'm actually working with Sienna who's based in Geneva um, but they've been a really wonderful team along with Cornell kind of going through the process because my background's actually marketing and advertising and strategy um, but and so it was a really it was a great process kind of jumping in and learning learning about beverage manufacturing. Um, mm -hmm. I'm doing my best and staying up late with all my books. I've got like a mini bookshelf over here <laughs> of like um, fun, really interestingly named books like Co Man or, or Con Man, how to pick the right co manufacturer. Um, so I am I am at the point where I am starting to um, potentially seek investment so I can start covering the cost of co-manufacturing. I, I have recently won a pitch competition for $20,000, which will cover uh, first run and, uh, and that initial test run. So I'm really excited about that. So it'll be coming soon, spring, spring bandita. Um, and, and then one more question. Um, mm -hmm. And then it sounds like we're probably gonna have to wrap up. Um, where, Great do time. You, yeah. where do you foresee, um, once, once you're working with that co-packer and you have this new sample, not new sample, but new product, um, where do you foresee yourself selling it? Is it, is it folk farmer's markets? So um, while I have been selling at farmer's markets up until this point, I'm really excited to be in a, a wider market that might be a little bit more accessible. So I am looking at going into grocery stores. So um, whether I, I know there's been there's mixed reviews in the beverage world about places like Whole Foods, but I'm definitely interested in like sprouts and, and starting to think about how do I expand my footprint beyond New York as well. So sprouts would be a great West Coast partner. Um, and, and I'm really excited to partner additionally with um, casual fast food. So like researching and exploring more helpful fast or 
casual fast food in industry. So whether it's exploring sweet green or even just local um, delis, I think the really important step is matching myself with an, an excellent partner whose focus is on distribution. And that tends to be for the beverage base, really how you can win some excellent partnerships. And I know um, places like or companies like Target are actually really, really excited about BIPOC and women owned businesses and mm -hmm. have a really amazing launch program for those. Like once you start to get your foothold into grocery, that would be the long term vision as well as airports. Since I, I used to be a big traveler for work, not so much anymore. Uh, but that's where I usually found it or found myself really needing Bandita uh, mm -hmm. so I could grab it and, and, you know, bring it on the plane. But um, that's definitely a long term vision as well. Great. Thank Great. You. I have one more really quick question. Don't cut me off, Michael. Is it is it in a plastic bottle or glass? It's in glass now. So originally it was in plastic, but I heard from um, my consumers that they really wanted to see it in glass. And I actually have collected glass from the community to repurpose. And I encourage the, the reuse of the bottles as well. Is that going to be a problem for the airports? Um, so actually, there there are glass bottles available, but I, that's an excellent question. I think there's also a question regarding um, many, like manufacturing. So right. Often, like right now, I'm looking at um, a septic and some other different options right. that require either um, like a Tetra pack or a, you know a plastic bottle. And mm -hmm. so I think my next step is finding the the small the bottle with the smallest footprint. And so I think yeah. a lot of those big decisions are going to come in you know. Uh, the next month. And so mm -hmm. a great question. Thank you. Yeah, great. Nice job. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Stuff. Thanks, Megan. I'm going to get the next presenter up. It's David from Bold and Gritty. Right, there we go. Let me share my screen here. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. And then if I if I share it like this, can you still see it? It just went black. It went black. It's all right. Uh, one moment. I can just, I can actually just do the presentation from here. If everybody can see it, I can just scroll through the slides. Yeah, it, it's visible on my screen. Perfect. I'm gonna roll with it. All right, I'm gonna yep. I'm, I'm mute myself. It. It's all yours. All right, hey, I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, this is awesome. Um, 490 Farmers, uh, Megan, uh, it's great to be in uh, the same company with, a, with another coffee um, connoisseur. So I'm David, I'm the found, founder of uh, Bold and Gritty uh, Coffee, and uh, we are a coffee-focused lifestyle brand that tells the stories of Black male success. Our slogan, Black Coffee, Black Candles, Black Stories, really embodies the essence of what our brand stands for. And that's because we believe that the story of every generation and every culture deserves to be told. Stories, they're powerful stories, they start movements. People really want to get behind a very powerful story. I'm a neurosurgeon, a neurosurgery resident actually, uh, turned entrepreneur who started uh, Bold and Gritty. And when my wife and I, we, we, we thought about sort of Bold and Gritty as a business, we wanted to address a single problem. We asked ourselves a single question. Would it be possible to develop a brand that shapes culture through storytelling. And as we began to think about that, we, it became clear to us that coffee is a very powerful vehicle for telling stories. People have conversations around a cup of coffee. Some of the most important conversations I've had revolve around a cup of coffee. And the question was, how can we use this vehicle of storytelling uh, in a way that has a social justice component and tells the story of African American men who have overcome against all at types of different adversity to become extremely successful. This is a, a market that has really not uh, been tapped into 
not only from a business aspect, but from a social justice aspect, the stories of black men, unfortunately, have been fetishized in the media. And so the, the story of sort of the individuals who are bold and gritty and have really just kind of turned their life into a, a powerful narrative um, have not really been told. And so that's sort of what Bold and Gritty sort of represents as a brand. And coffee is sort of the vehicle for which we really sort of change this narrative. And we believe this is important because representation matters. Right now, there is no well-established lifestyle brand that caters to black men ages 18 to 40. And we all know that brands, they thrive on culture, not just products, but the culture that lies behind the brand. And we know that stories, as I said before, stories and images of successful black men are missing from mainstream, me mainstream media and popular culture. And when you think about coffee as a vehicle for sort of telling very powerful stories and the coffee as a, as a vehicle for developing community, uh, you think about the different phases of coffee. And right now we're in what we would consider the third wave of coffee, which is, is focused on sourcing really high quality beans um, and sort of meeting the consumer at a level where they're conscious about where those beans are coming from, the taste of those beans, uh, being able to have a nice pour over coffee. But the, the issue with third wave coffee as it currently stands is that it hasn't really evolved to meet the growing demands of a rapidly changing US population and its coffee needs. So we're, we're more than just a coffee co company, we're a lifestyle. And so as we sort of tell the stories of, of black male success, stories of individuals like myself, we use imaging, vivid imaging. So you look at our logo and we capitalize on the image of a black man riding a horse with his, wrist, with his fist raised, right? It's a, it's a powerful image. It's really one of the boldest and grittiest statements I think I could make uh, from a branding perspective that demonstrates our commitment to uh, forward thinking as it relates to um, targeting uh, this demographic of individuals and sharing their narratives and sharing their stories, right? Um, you know, it's an image that demonstrates, you know, uh, the, the, just the resilience and the doggedness of someone who blazes a path against all odds to make a positive impact on the world. So we tell the stories of young men making history we do this again with coffee, but we also do this in a graphical way. Think of Joan Soda. Joan Soda made its mark on the world by taking everyday pictures and putting them on its products. You submitted a product to Joan Soda and it showed up on, on the bottle and you were excited if, you're, if your picture was there. We've taken this model and, and we've, we've turned it um, into a model for how we distribute our coffee and how we do our packaging and how we share our na narratives. And so we highlight individuals, like I said, African-American men who have done tremendous things, who have amazing stories. We pair them with our packaging of our coffee as a way to tell the stories of now. So we tell the stories of- 30 of, seconds, David. Basically, 30 seconds left. Yeah. Um, so with, we do this with intentional branding that inspires a bold and gritty revolution with 5% of profits that go towards establishing a bold and gritty scholarship fund. If you look at the market for US retail coffee, 46.5 billion. Uh, if you break that down into our potential target market uh, of $1 million, this is with a $50 average spend across 18,000 clients scaling or, or looking down to 2025. And you can see that African Americans are a significant driving force um, in basically driving key segments of the coffee industry, including gourmet, ready to drink, cold brew, and specialty coffees. This is a, a, a segment of our competition, um, looking at how we differentiate ourselves from the market. As a lifestyle coffee company, we are basically selling a product that basically says, that this coffee gives you strength. This coffee allows you to be bold and gritty like the stories of the men that we, that we tell. It's sort of like Red Bull that gives you wings. We're selling a bold and gritty philosophy. We're selling a lifestyle, not just a coffee. We've been in business for 14 weeks. We've sold 245 pounds of coffee, have done $13.5,000 in res revenue. 
we have had over uh, about 300 unique customers and in just 14 weeks we've, we've amassed a following of about 1400 uh, individuals on Instagram. This is uh, just a breakdown of our revenue based upon the products that we sell with coffee and merchandise leading, leading the way, um, demonstrating the importance of this being a movement. And with the current rate at which uh, we are, are generating revenue, we're projected to make $50.1,000 this year. Um, so this is just sort of a, a, a snapshot of Bold and Pretty Coffee, of sort of where we are, where we stand, the importance of us telling stories. And it's because every great story needs coffee, and black coffee is black culture. We focus on specialty coffee that's traceable to the farms and washing stations from which the coffee is sourced. We use single origins, uh, packaging that includes beautifully illustrated uh, story cards and inspirational materials. And we are branding ourselves as the vanguard of fourth wave coffee. This is our team, uh, myself, uh, my wife, who is a Simon uh, MBA grad, uh, Amber, who's our creative director, and then our advisors, uh, Richard Glazer, who's the founder of Rock Growth, and Bert Foster, who's the founder of Foster Memories. Awesome. Thanks, David. I'm going to add the judges here for their Q&A. David, thank you for that. Um, I'll, I'll start. I know we're short on time, and Maureen's still um, getting up there. Um, and and Maureen is the branding person, but I'm on your website, and it's beautiful. And I love the the look and feel of of your coffee too. Um, a clarifying question to start. Um, it 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 looks like you're doing direct to consumer so far. I mean, yes. Um, it, what is is your is your goal to have cafes? Is it to remain in that direct consumer? Is it to sell to cafes? Can you speak to that? Yeah. So um, the so right now we're actually we've branded we branched out into that space. So we have uh, one retail location here in Rochester that focuses on selling our merchandise, and then uh, we have a uh, actually a grocer in Grand Rapids, Michigan, who is selling our whole bean coffee. And that actually is new this month. So uh, if you actually, if you looked at the breakdown, there was a retail component uh, on our revenue. Um, and it's actually a decent slice for only uh, rolling out within the last three weeks. So that is uh, an area for growth. When we look, when we described our sort of our market um, of 1 million, it doesn't fully include uh, retail. Um, at that point, it just basically includes our direct to consumer model and what we can gain from basically just online sales um but that is definitely uh an area that we're going but i think the important thing here is that is you know while yes this is a food and beverage pitch and yes we're branded sort of as a coffee company you know very much like nike isn't just selling you a shoe right it's selling you a philosophy of just do it red bull is selling you a philosophy that if you drink this it will give you wings we're selling a philosophy of the bold and gritty life of the qualities that have really made the men that we share these stories of really successful, right? So we're highlighting a different narrative, but like you think you can imagine that as we grow and we develop this, this philosophy, it's, it's bigger than just a cafe, right? You can think of sort of co-working spaces, uh, leadership development, uh, you know, workshops focused on targeting a niche demographic that's really been left out of that space, right? So when you think about um, how do we, enhance the bold and gritty life of our target demographic, and then provide them with the tools and resources to go out and make a better life for themselves and for their communities and for their families. So, you know, as we scale, it's bigger than just going out into coffee shops, right? You know, we, we envision, you know, it, it's actually really interesting. You think of our logo as the, as the guy on a horse, right? And so there's a, there's a brand that's not in the coffee sector, but it's in the alcohol sector, which is Uncle Nearest. And um, Uncle Nearest is sort of the like the the brother to Jack Daniels, and, and they've basically established themselves on a farm in the middle of Tennessee, and they have a ton of horses, right? And you know probably like 150 acres of land, and you could think of sort of having a homestead for bold and gritty, right? 
uh, as Bowling Gritty scales and becomes, you know, a much larger national entity, where then you bring people in uh, and you do these leadership development opportunities. You know, you tie in with the branding of the individual and the horse. You do equine therapy. Um, and so this is like a much larger sort of lifestyle brand where coffee is the initial vehicle. The coffee and the merch is the initial vehicle for us telling the stories, growing, scaling, getting our name out there on a national level. But the mission is much more social justice oriented, um, leadership development, uh, community building, um, and changing the narrative around black male success. I So I'll jump in here with one. I love how much traction you've been able to get in such a short period of time. I mean, it shows that you're bold and gritty yourself in your ability to, you know, hit the ground running with this and, and get such traction. Um, can you explain the symbolism of the horse? I mean, I might be missing something, but, yeah. you know, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so um, really, so I, I was riding in a car with my wife. And again, we were thinking about, okay, how do we tell these stories? How do we change this narrative? And I, I just really, I looked at her and I asked her and I said, what's one thing that you really don't see African-Americans doing? Uh huh. And the first thing that came to her mind was horseback riding. It's actually a little bit more common in the South than it is in the uh -huh. North. But, you know, I, I looked at her and I was like, wow, you're really right. And um, there's, you know, when we think about sort of the artistic pieces that we do, um, and I don't know if you've heard of Kehinde Wiley. He actually did the national portrait for the Obamas mm -hmm. yep. um, several years mm -hmm. ago. He also did this really amazing uh, statue that was actually, it was actually displayed in Times Square of a black man riding a horse. And that, mm -hmm. man, it was such a powerful graphic and powerful image. And there's another image that's really stuck with me is that I believe it was like the 1970 Olympics where uh, the, the individuals, when they, they won their award, they stood on the podium with their fists raised as a sign of sort of solidarity um, and sort of recognizing the social justice issues that are happening in, in the United mm -hmm. States. And it's been a symbol in the black Got community it. of pride. And so when you pair those two things together, you're, you're basically saying like, wow, this is, this is a strong individual doing something that you wouldn't technically see. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it, it's, a, it's the boldest and grittiest symbol that I could think of that um, brings pride um, and a sense of sort of, uh, you know, just uh, uh, bold, like grittiness yeah. to, um, you know, what it is we do. So I think it's like 100% on brand. And I think that, you know, not just does it, it doesn't just resonate with the African-American population, but it's like, it's a symbol that allows us like as a country and as yeah. like everyone who, you know, buys into what we're doing to have like a forward thinking model where you don't just like, you know, uh, look at like success, right? You don't just look at like what the America thinks success is, but you like highlight the struggle as much as you do mm -hmm. the spotlight, yeah. right? Yeah. And so that's, that's exactly yeah. what we're I think it's great. And I, I love the way that you're, you're doing it and, and telling your story, especially visually on Instagram with the crowns to carry the brand through. So I know we don't have time for a lot of questions, but great job. Thanks. Thank, thank you, David. And I'm going to get um, Abdullah set up for the next presentation. Uh, hello? Yes, we can hear you, Abdullah. All right, great. Uh, let me just share my screen. Guys, we're, we're seeing a lot of good dialogue in the chat, too. We're, we're running a little over on time here. So, you know, I, I'm seeing a lot of encouraging things. If people are, are happy with that, send a quick message or something because we want to make sure uh, we, I stay close to on time as possible. But if everyone's, you know, getting a lot of value out of this, just send a couple quick messages. Um, we'll try to keep things, you know, running uh, close to schedule, um, but I, I don't want to sacrifice any of the kind of knowledge exchange or, you know, feedback we're getting either. Okay. Um, can you guys see my presentation right now? Yeah, you're where you can see your web browser with the slides shared as well. Okay, because um, I have it. Um, is this like, can you see like full screen now? It's now loading and now it's full screen. Okay, great. 
Um, so I'll just start my timer. Uh, all right. So I'm Abdullah Islam presenting our startup Jing Tian Halal. So this is a halal Asian fusion cuisine restaurant. Um, in the Buffalo industry, um, this the food market is really stagnant, uh, despite the growing population and developments. And we really want to cater towards uh, this sector, which is pretty much untouched uh, in Buffalo and uh, much of greater Western New York. Um, finding halal Chinese food in across Western New York is pretty difficult, especially um, in Buffalo. Um, so what we do, um, we're helping serve great food for everyone. Um, you know, we're going to have a system online where they order online and we deliver this halal Asian fusion cuisine either um, at your house or you can even have a grab and go type of system. Um, so why now? 60% of US customers order delivery or takeout once a week. 59% uh, of restaurant orders uh, from millennials are takeout or delivery. Orders placed uh, via smartphone and mobile apps will become a 38 billion industry by 2020. So the reason that we've decided to work in this type of business model, trying to focus more online, uh, is trying to cater towards the younger population who are gonna be more interested in trying out and looking for uh, unique cuisine uh, and, you know, like going out and really, um, you know, experiencing, um, you know, what Buffalo has to offer. So the U.S. Census Bureau's 2016 American Community Sur Survey in the city of Buffalo noted that 25 to 34 year olds outpaces um, the national average at 13.4 percent growth. Um, and I'm sure we all have seen like the uh, Buffalo, the developments in Buffalo economically as well as on the, um, the housing front. So economically, you've seen like Solar City, which is like a nine hundred million dollar project, um, the medical campus um, that's also developed downtown, as well as in the the waterfront. Um, we've also seen a lot of immigrant uh, a rise in immigration um, to Buffalo. Um, specifically, we've seen uh, the Bengali demographic increasing. Uh, so all of these combined uh, sets up Buffalo as a perfect kind of place to start off from for a restaurant that's really oriented to a population that has no other access to um, this type of cuisine. Um, so halal, as I forgot to kind of explain, is um, meat that's processed uh, according to Islamic guidelines. So Muslim people can't eat uh, meat anywhere else or any other meats. Um, unless they follow these Islamic uh, guidelines of meat processing, to the concept of kosher in Judaism. So that's why it's kind of very unique and the only place that really caters towards it. Uh, so we did get the chance to uh, try to test out the market a little bit. So it was only 22 people that kind of responded to the survey, but it was similar results. 59.1% people prefer dining out uh, or takeout instead of dining in. Uh, and similarly, we got some idea about the time and hours of the day where we should be uh, trying to serve our market. So we're a bit early in the uh, business development process. So what we're looking at right now is building a ghost kitchen. So essentially working with food incubator programs. So here in Buffalo, we have the Broadway market. Uh, so I did get the chance to talk with Mike uh, at the West Side Bazaar and he let me know that uh, at the Broadway Market, uh, they have uh, f like a food incubator program where we can rent and um, kind of work out of there. So our idea would be more of a grab and go type of system for catering and you know getting exposure, building online delivery and ordering systems. Uh, down the line, we are thinking to go to the West Side Bazaar. So he gave me a timeline of 10 to 12 months where they're planning to expand and take in more restaurants. Um, so the idea would be to, you know, be established as LLC, uh, get a tax ID, um, and also build capital. So that happened through, you know, catering and online ordering and delivery. So who is our competition? Uh, in Buffalo, there's pretty much no competition. Um, so that makes us, uh, you know, the ideal uh, startup here. And yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Um, feel free to take a look at our website.
and that's it. I hope you liked the, the presentation and thank you for listening. Awesome. Thank you, Abdullah. You're right on time, too. I'm going to bring the judges back up. And uh, we also have uh, one of our other judges, Terrell, was able to join us. So I'm going to add him as well. Hi there. Great job. Thank you. So I'll start while um, the rest of my fellow judges are coming in here. You mentioned ghost kitchens. Is that going to are you going to be able to do all food production with ghost kitchens? Um. Well, the way that they have the food incubator set up at the Broadway Market, um, the way I understood it, and when I talked to uh, the manager there, he said that so you'll have like a full setup. Uh, you rent out a time slot. You work there from, you know, say you're working 10 to 12 and then you go out and you're delivering for the next hour or two so you rent out that location you also have you have full kitchen space it's an entire kitchen you have storage area for if you want to keep your produce you have refrigeration systems everything's there um, so working out of that would be our ideal setup um, so that we can really gain exposure and kind of mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, can you hear me i don't know why my Video's not showing up. Um, I'm, I'm available. Yeah, we can hear you yeah, and, yeah. and see you. Oh, yeah. I just can't see myself. Okay, uh, <laughs> that's fine. So, um, and, and granted, uh, my understanding of the Broadway market is obviously not as robust as my understanding of the operation that we have at the commissary. But I do know that, for instance, we've had people who have interested in having a a, a, um, a kosher kitchen. And that that is not feasible financially in our space due to the fact that they would have to have someone, uh, a rabbi, come in and bless the three bay sink and rent the convection oven for hours ahead of time because it has to run at a certain heat and nobody else can use it. Um, I'm not as familiar with halal. Um, so I'm wondering if those barriers would also be an issue, especially from a, a logistical but as well as a financial perspective. And then double barrel question, um, what is the likelihood, like how subscribed is the Broadway market, especially in this era of ghost kitchens, virtual restaurants being so popular? Um, mm -hmm. What is your outlook and understanding how quickly you could be in that space? Um, so for the first question, um, Halal, it, it doesn't uh, really apply to like the tools or machines that we're really using it's more like more so the meat processing um so the only thing i guess that might be an issue but really wouldn't is like the tools that we're using like you know cross contamination say like uh say the say the pans or knives were used to like cut pork or something or um, something that would be uh, not in our like a dietary restriction um so then you would have to just wash them and then use them um, so we, I'm thinking that we wouldn't be sharing kind of utensils and pots and pans with uh, the other renters. Uh, so that wouldn't be an issue for us. Uh, and the second question, um, well, oh yeah, so the Broadway market. So um, right now the Broadway market does get pretty busy, but because of COVID, um, I mean, obviously it's kind of quiet. <laughs> so it, it does get quite busy. Uh, I remember earlier uh, I had, I've been there a few times and it is quite busy and it does get a lot of through flow, like a foot flow, foot, foot traffic. Um, and more so at the West Side Bazaar. And the reason I was more interested in the West Side Bazaar um, because so they're telling me that uh, bus loads of people actually come. So like church groups, they come to the West Side Bazaar, they unload, um, you know, there's a, quite a few different cuisines there. And he even told me, uh, Mike was telling me that you know, a lot of people come through and they're looking for halal Chinese, but there just isn't any. So um, that was one thing. And they also do catering with uh, Duval University. So those aspects kind of really made me interested in, you know, finally establishing a spot on with the West Side Bazaar. Um, and so, yeah, and so more so when we do establish a place in the Broadway market, I'm thinking more like online delivery as opposed to trying to get foot traffic there. Uh, just because it might be more convenient and more popular 
so getting an exposure might be quicker um, because I'm not really sure the demographic of you know, the Muslim population or the uh, people looking for Chinese food at Broadway Market because it's more like a it's more like an open face market, so kind of like confectionaries. Um, sometimes uh, I know that they have like a fish market on the side as well, so I'm, I'm not really sure how well. Um, that would be just like trying to get foot traffic in and of itself, but working out of the incubator kitchen, I think it's a good, good goal. Mm -hmm. All right, we're at time. Uh, any, any last question? Thank you. Nope, that's good. That's it. All right, thanks, Abdul. Great presentation. Thanks. Joe, we got you coming up. Bat and clean up here. I'm ready. All right, I'm gonna. Could you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I would have liked to have had my knife hand get up, but uh, I'm doing this presentation from uh, from my from my boss's office. So I'm uh, grateful that he's uh, flexible enough to allow me to do this on his time. Does he give you, or do you have to give him any equity for it? Uh, he gets free food. Oh, there you go. That's I funny. bring in, I bring, I've been feeding the office for the last several months. So I got everybody on a plant-based diet. Uh, everyone's losing weight. It's pretty awesome. We're really kind of starting to explore the, um, uh, the coaching side of things here this year. Awesome. Uh, are, you, are you sharing slides today? I am. Let me, so I need to share, let me bring my slides to this screen first. So I will share my screen. Hopefully this goes to plan, application window, this one, share. I'm gonna lead us off with a uh, motivational quick video that I work very hard on. So when you guys are ready, go ahead and start the clock and I'll click. We, one second, are you trying to like full screen or are you ready just to go in this mode right now? I'm ready to go with this mode. Pack All right, time. the floor is yours. Can you guys hear it? I can put noise, but it's the screen is white. Is it supposed to be white? No. Who are we? All right, we're skipping the video. All right. Go here. We're seeing 2013, 2000, or 2012, 2013, 2014. You can see all three of them right now? Yes. Wow. All right. I'm going to do the best I can with what I got here. All right. Uh, yours. 2012. While raising two kids under two and battling PTSD, a Marine veteran graduates Syracuse University in 2012, earning a degree in accounting and entrepreneurship with high honors. In 2013, he struggles with the stress of a divorce and constantly being on the road as a traveling auditor. After hitting a point that felt like rock bottom, he changes his mindset and looked to healthy eating and exercise to manage his stress. He witnessed the firsthand experience of meal prepping every week, spending most Sundays cooking and bringing these meals with him on the road. The cleaner he ate, the better he felt, and the more he looked at how other people ate, the standard American diet, and how kids are educated on nutrition. Let's fast forward to 2020, and we see Nestle acquires Freshly for $1.5 billion. That's with a B, ladies and gentlemen. We all, all, we all know online shopping and meal delivery is growing exponentially. The pandemic has only reinforced that this is the future of consumerism. My name's Joe Dunaway, and I'm the founder and CEO of Knife Hand Nutrition.
Knife Hand is a frozen food manufacturer focused on plant-based meals that fuel the peak performance for athletes and busy professionals on and off the field. Other plant-based meal delivery companies target women and vegans. Knife Hand is a lifestyle brand that believes males and athletes are an underserved market. Hence, why we decided to go with the name Knife Hand. First, to speak to our military roots and tradition, but also as an ironic undertone that a Marine veteran is advocating a plant-based diet? Hmm. Each meal is around 16 ounces. Yes, that's one pound of plant-based meals in each meal and 500 calories with macros designed to fuel the busy and active lifestyle. Meals are available online with a minimum quantity of four and sell for $12 each. That's a $50 minimum charge, uh, minimum, minimum order. We charge our customers for delivery and our margins are 40%. Hey, Joseph, we're still seeing the 2013, 14 slide. Really? You yeah. waited that long to let me know? Shoot. Um, Apologize, I heard clicking and then didn't see slides. Before. Um, I think the best way to do this is maybe I'll stop sharing and share from, I'll share my whole screen, share entire screen. Probably not gonna be what I really want, but uh, so you guys missed all the cool pictures. Wow. Oh, we're getting the animations with slides now. Hey. All right. All right. I'll give you a block. Okay. Um, not sure really where that believes. So here's our beautiful meals. Um, you can find these uh, pictures as long as as well as their nutrition facts on our website at www.knifehandnutrition.com. All right. So this is where we left off. Our meals are flash frozen with a blast chiller, tray sealed, then shipped out across the United States. The blast chiller flash freezes our meals within minutes, as opposed to hours in a, using a traditional freezer. This improves uh, fiber, uh, no, uh, this preserves uh, cell membrane and also uh, get, uh, offers a more fresh delivery when our consumers decide to eat it. Um, the tray sealer locks in freshness by applying a peel away heat seal film. For our competition, we have our local competitors up top, Core Life Eatery, Original Grain, and of course Wegmans. All three offer fresh meal delivery either internally or through the grub hubs of the world um there are no currently there's no uh local frozen plant-based meal delivery competitors so to speak to that we'll look at a national scale uh fire road foods is a plant-based they came out this year they're a plant-based meal delivery company selling frozen performance meals uh whereas vistro and plant pure nation they sell uh, plant-based meals, but they don't really, they focus a little bit more towards that uh, vegan and female market. Probably wondering why this slide came up. Our mission is to make plant-based meals widely available to families across the country. Our vision is to disrupt the school lunch industry. As a services able veteran owned business or SDV, SDVOB, we're able to bid on government contracts and offer catering style portions to public schools and help redefine healthy eating. So why plant-based meal delivery? Where does that come from? Well, in order to do business with the government, a business must be first establish, must first establish credibility. Although our long-term goals for Knife Hand is to compete at a national level, our passion is to change the way the world thinks about nutrition and lead the charge in disease prevention from an early age. Right now, only affluent individuals are able to afford healthier lifestyles. Food deserts in the inner city in rural America make it challenging for low socioeconomic families to afford healthy eating. And our kids are currently eating this. School lunches. This is what they grow up thinking is healthy. 
During the pandemic, we saw school sending school lunches, lunch meals home to kids and other families while they learned remotely. NIFAN will work with state and local governments to subsidize NIFAN meals to less fortunate families, as well as offering delicious, healthy plant-based meals to schools in a catering model. Our, te our team consists of myself, our executive chef consultant, Sarah Hassler, and our registered dietitian, Ashley Russo. Our BAL team is Pathfinder Bank, CH Insurance, and Bond Shenick and King. And I, of course, am the accountant. In 2020, we did over 15,000 sales despite not being able to attend events and, attend events and uh, sporting events such as 5Ks and triathlons. KnifeHand has already done 8,000 in sales year to day in 2021 and on pace to do over 70,000 in 2021, though our goal is to hit at least six figures. I'm happy to take it. What's that? 30 seconds left. Good. I'm done. I'm happy to take any questions. All right. Should I answer it now? Great presentation. Glad we got the slides working. Yeah, well, I'm just glad you guys got to see the uh, the food photography. Well, at least you got to see that. <laughs> Joseph, I, after we do the Q and A, I would say if, if you have a link to that video, you might want to share with people. Uh, feel free to you know post that in the chat. Yeah. Okay. And I'll get the the timer going for the the Q and A. Sure. Or more. Okay. Here we go. Great job. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about why frozen as opposed to fresh? So we had done a lot of talking to competitors along the way. I won't name the one we spoke to, but uh, the science behind frozen means, so food is in a constant state of rot from the second it's picked to going to the distributor, to making it to the uh, kitchen, to cooking, to packaging, to getting to your house, to being in your refrigerator, and then you finally eating, food is in a constant state of rot. When we blast chill our meals, we stand by the claim that our meals are fresher than fresh meals. So that's why we go with frozen. The, uh, the cellular integrity of meals in a blast chilled uh, environment makes it, uh, um, makes it so that you're not having the uh, texture of food that's been uh, frozen in your traditional uh, freezer. Okay. We just we believe we're delivering a, a higher quality product. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Joe. Um, can you clarify? Is your focus in schools? Is that where you're? Yeah, heart? I know. I'm all over the place. I hear you. So, my heart's really. You know, I love my kids. I have four of them. You know, and you know that's that's truly where my heart is. Uh, is to is to redefine and reeducate you know, how we uh, educate our children on, you know, the standard American diet. Uh, right now, I, I feel like, you know, there's a lot of uh, misinformation on what's truly uh, healthy. And our kids are growing up thinking that eating this way is healthier. So to be clear, I am, I'm geared towards, I'm an athlete, I'm, I'm, in the mil, uh, I'm a military veteran, I'm geared towards this athlete, this high uh, intensity uh, market. Um, my goal is to continue taking life and nutrition in, into the future as to compete with other plant-based meal delivery companies. But if I get the opportunity, I really want to leverage my uh, veteran status, work with schools and government agencies to really have a, a larger impact, a global impact uh, in redefining what's healthy. So if that's the long-term, what are you seeing as the short-term in terms of uh, market base? Uh, so short-term are athletes and busy professionals. I mean, I speak that language, I am that person, I am the avatar of uh, that target market. Um, I, I consider myself still uh, an amateur athlete I'm a busy professional. Uh, I cart my kids to every single sporting event I possibly can. Um, and you know, I work out at 5.30 in the morning because there's no other time to do it. Um, so having these plant-based meals that are able to be delivered to other uh, individuals like myself 
um, just make it a lot easier. So that is our, 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 our focus and our concentration right now. And, and where, I'm sorry, Maureen, I'm, I'm, I'm hogging that. No, that's um, where are you producing now? And, and you can be vague, that's fine. Um, but where are you producing now? <laughs> and, um, and how are you delivering to your customers? Um, I'm happy to be vague. We, we produce in Syracuse and we ship out of Syracuse. Um, I have significant background in logistics, uh, as in the Marine Corps, I was, uh, motor transportation, uh, what you think, oh, I'm driving the whole time, but really it's a lot of, I'm delivering things a lot of the time, whether it's troops, fuel, ammunition, water, food. Um, so, uh, as far as our packaging, we have it down pretty good. We're shipping everything, UPS, FedEx, or, uh, USPS through the XPS app, um, uh, we, we've shipped all the way to California multiple times. Uh, we don't feel like we're really competitive on a national level, but we don't want to stop ourselves from being able to offer uh, customers our product anywhere. But our focus is to grow regionally. Okay, thank, thank you. Do we have any last questions? I'm good. All right. Okay. I will just say, Michael, I didn't really have an ask, right? Um, I have an idea of what our ask would be, but I, I just don't think it, we're not, we're not there. We're not at the right time. I think my ask right now would just be, you know, to the judges and to the audience to, I think I, I would benefit immensely from a, a coach slash mentor that has this type of industry experience. That would be my ask. And just to kind of help me network and, get me uh, closer to on the right track of, of where I want to go. And that's it. I love you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone else did a fantastic job. Very humble to be on the same stage as you guys. No, this is great. Yeah. Uh, th this so that Joseph, you were the, you know, bringing up the rear there. Uh, I think we ended strong. I appreciate everyone uh, making it through any sort of technical glitch, but these presentations are great. Everyone has been asking questions or chiming in the chat. This has been awesome. I, I love all to see all the support here. I'm going to ask for the judges to join me in a, uh, another digital room. At this time, we've done breakout rooms before, but because of all this dialogue, I think if I just put uh, all the presenters up on stage, would you guys feel comfortable kind of looking at the chat and letting people kind of chime in and ask questions? Uh, I think you guys could self-manage. Um, and then more. I'll take Maureen, Laura. Uh, over to another room and come up with a quick deliberation. Um, so unless I, I see any vetoes, I'm just going to start turning on the screens for the uh, the presenters. And again, I'd say uh, for those that are you know participating, you just start using that chat channel. Hopefully, everyone could find that. You know, on the it's on my right hand side as far as the chat messages. It's been pretty busy throughout the presentation, so feel free to ask some questions of these guys. Uh, again, I'll ask the the, the startup founders to kind of self-manage. Give me one second as I get you all up here. And uh, Maureen, Laura, I, I, I sent another link to you guys. Um, I'm going to hop over there um, and let this, let the, the, the startup founders here uh, connect a little bit with the community. Okay. Awesome. Um, while we wait for questions, does anyone want to share any like great, I guess, lessons they've learned like since starting their business? Go for it. <laughs> so I'm used to kicking down doors. I have very little patience and growing a business, especially bootstrapped. Um, we actually lost financing when we launched our website in April because of the pandemic and the credit freeze. Mm -hmm. Um so my, my lack of patience actually helped me, you know, in that instance, because we launched bootstrap. I was like, people are home, we're locked in, everyone's ordering, you know, let's go, 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 let's bootstrap, let's get the website up. However, it was tough for me to kind of pump the brakes after that. And um, at this point, I've gotten really comfortable with A, being uncomfortable, but also B, trusting in the process and being patient. Um, if you're anything like me and you're kind of high strung, uh, you know, 
talk to as many people that have been in your position in this position as possible. And you'll hear probably nine times out of 10 that, you know, just be patient mm -hmm. and you want to, you may have all the ideas that you want that, that, you know, will work, but it's always about, you know, getting your ducks in order. Um, so that that was the the biggest thing I've learned over the last few years. Yeah, definitely. I hear you on that. How about anyone else? Does anyone else have any like great lessons they've learned since launching their their business? I, I'm happy to share one as well. Oh, oh, David, did were you hopping in? Oh, sorry, or Abdul, Abdullah. Sorry, I'm like I didn't see who spoke. <laughs> I'm trying to watch everyone's squares really quickly. <laughs> um, so I had a bit of a question. So I was wondering. Did you guys uh, find that financing was the way to go with starting up your business? I know Courtney, I think she did most of her stuff out of like volunteer work, but for the rest of you guys, did you think kind of um, like the way to build up your business or did you guys have other types of ways of revenue for building capital? We've mostly gotten like donations, but we're kind of a different model than the rest of you guys, I think. So I don't know. But I think we agree that like, yeah, we would love to have that finance option. So we love seeing like what David especially has done and Joseph, like we want to be in those like places, even though like David, like people were like, oh, you should, you look like a clothing company. It's like, no, we're like flipping the script on a lot of people, right? Like just as that's what you view us as, that's, you know what I mean? Like, so us like, especially when she was like well what's angel investor mean like for me like your investment is driving by every day and seeing this community not dilapidated so for me that that's like my largest investment so yeah do i think like for you like i think that might be something that definitely needs to be looked at in a different way and i'll let a for-profit company speak with you. yeah no I, I think for us just uh getting off the ground uh, a lot of just like assistance from family. Um, and um, I guess bootstrapping is, a, is like the right term, but you know, just we only spend as much as like we have. So, you know, like the first like $500 was spent on, you know, like logo and marketing and working with somebody who also believed in our vision. And then, you know, the next like couple hundred dollars was for like the first set of merchandise and then everything that, you know, everything that we got in from that just, you just put back in the business and then you grow from there. So, um, you know, I, everything that we put in the business has come from like revenue with a very small initial startup and a lot of like contributions of like blood, sweat and tears and time and energy from, you know, myself and just like family members that like help us with uh, different projects. Makes sense. I like so Thanks, advice someone once gave me was like, you never try your best not to spend your money. And it's really interesting um, because uh, of course it's like, none of us want to fail, but right. If you, if you're going to fail, try to fail with someone else's money so you can have, you try to fund your next idea. Um, but there's a lot of stats around um, woman or women led businesses and BIPOC led businesses where we tend to not seek funding. We tend to do more bootstrapping. And I thought that was like a really interesting uh, statistic of like this idea, like I want to prove myself. And it became this badge of honor of like, wanting to say I bootstrapped. And in reality, we need to be seeking funding. We need to be getting out there. And still, uh, it's like the smallest percentage of VC like funding is actually going to BIPOC or women-led businesses. I like I I feel I've been reading a lot of stats lately and I can't remember them. They're all going like rushing together now. But it's still like upsetting. Like I know for example, I think um uh, black owned businesses, the amount of VC funding from 2019 to 2020 went down. Why is that happening? That that's unacceptable, and I think we need to make sure we're getting more diversity in as, in asking for money. Um, so I definitely, if you can ask for money, go for it. I think um, I think in my experience, connecting with other founders, talking to people who have already pitched has been really helpful. I have not officially gone to VC or anything yet. That's going to be in my next step, but no. Yeah, funding's funding's tricky. I mean, we all we all love to get money, right? That's that's number one. Uh, for, so for me, like I'm all self-funded, um, cause I work a full-time job and I do, I burn both ends of the candle. So this is something that I do. I, I, I check into my second job, you know, every night to, to handle orders and stuff. But, um, I, I won pitch competitions. I think Megan, obviously you said you, you won some funding from a recent competition. That's one way because 
uh, not only is that a way to get money, but it's also a great way to get feedback. If you go into those competitions, just looking to at least get feedback, obviously do your best. And, you know, I think any of us have that, that killer instinct to want to win, right. And, 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 and go to the next level. But if, if at least you're getting feedback to take you to the next level and expanding your network, then that's some type of currency as well. So you're getting that and you're putting yourself in a position to potentially win some funding. And then this doesn't help you very much right now, unfortunately, but I spent almost a year at farmers markets and events, you know, sampling my meals out um, and, and selling them directly to my customers. And then uh, to piggyback off that, uh, as far as just advice for any new startups is talk to as many people as humanly possible, especially your, your, your target customers. Go to a store where, or go to the section where they might have halal in a store, you know, bump into people by accident and just kick up a conversation. Um, I never turn down. Uh, I, know, I can't say never, but I generally look at any meeting I have that I know I have. Uh, I know I'm going to have a, that I'm, that I'm going into that meeting with, but I always walk out with B, C, and D, other things, other opportunities that present themselves or other network opportunities, other contacts that develop in that meeting or conversation. So talk in your sleep about it. Just come, talk it into existence is a form of currency as well. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks hey, on that note, actually, um, I wanted to just throw in, we're going to be um, doing a farmer's market this year in like across from our space in the uh, like South Wedge area. So if anybody's interested in vending, just like send us an email. Um, or we would love to have you guys there. Because you guys are all awesome. And like, we'd love to just connect on that note. So yeah, please. Cool. Very cool. That's awesome. I'm so excited to learn more about 490 farmers. Like I'm, I'm obsessed now. I think it's so uh, important, so, so critically important. And even just like in my own experience, moving from the city and moving to somewhere a little bit more rural and like my own relationship with growing food, it's completely changed my like relationship with how I live. It's really, yeah, it's huge. It's like, it's literally what, you know, keeps you going and like makes yeah. you function well and stuff. If you, if you don't have like good food and yeah, and that's why we love like it. Joseph's model, like being vegan, that's super important to us. Like, right. Like David being a, a BIPOC industry, like that's local. Like we love, like that's what four nineties is. And like, so we just joined this competition as a hope. Like we, we're not a, you know, like the same type of startup that you we guys just want are. To meet, meet you all and we're like, just like, Hey, this is a super great opportunity where like you guys all belong in our community. Like it's the point of it for us. So yeah come drive by hang out let's sell your stuff let's have you make money and then you can donate back <laughs> always, this has been dope all, you, everybody always be that authentic guys i love it don't don't say that you're not like us because you you are in your own way you're Thank here you. so you you're are, hustlers but yeah keep that authenticity i love it that's yeah. great um Megan, are you are you in new york or are you in rochester i just wanted to ask quick Oh, I'm all over the place right now, but okay. I, I recently moved from New York City when the pandemic started. So I'm spending some time in Geneva and everything for the oh, week. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. Cool. Well, it's nice to meet all of you. Just so it is. Yeah. yeah. Super lovely. Yeah, no, this is great. Um, I guess, what about while we're waiting for them to come back? I'm like, I want to fill the gaps. Um, what about um, maybe like um, your favorite part about uh, being an entrepreneur, or running your own business. I do it for my family. I'm working 80 hours so I can work less hours right now, but I don't know how that's really going to work. I feel like even when knife hand does go to the point where I'm paying myself and I'm work, I feel like it's still going to be a lot, but I'll have the flexibility. I'll be able to build my own team, build my own culture. I've been through, so I'm happy to be where I am right now from an accounting standpoint but I've worked for the man. I've worked for very large corporations and felt like a nobody and just a number. And I want to, I want to build my own culture. I want to, you know, empower people and actually, you know, make people feel important and be happy to go to work. And, you know, that's a part of my success is also, you know, bringing other people along with me. So.
Ooh, a question has entered the chat. Do you guys have any fears in your entrepreneurial journey? Any of the presenters want to share? I'll go ahead. Um, I think fear, um, leaving leaving a full-time job and pursuing Bandita was really, really that first fear and that first hurdle and like having to, to make sure like, do I have enough savings? Do I do it? Like, and even just going to my partner and saying, Hey, I want to leave my full-time job. Like, is that okay? Can we do this? And, um, and so that was, that was kind of my biggest fear is that first jump and like kind of commitment into saying, this is it, giving it my all. And, and I mean, that's always really scary whenever you have a big change like that. But I think, the bigger fear for me would be fast forward five, 10 years and never have acting on it. And I think that would have been the bigger fear and the bigger regret. And so I say, I'm sure many can agree, but you know, go for it. Like if you're scared, just go for it and see what happens. And I'm sure you'll have a backup plan. No worries. Yeah. And there's also something called the imposter syndrome where you'll ebb and flow like am i doing the right thing am i spending too much time on something that's not going to go um you know surround yourself with you know not people that tell you what you want to hear tell surround yourself with people that tell you what you got to hear um and and imposter syndrome is real like and and you just got to battle through it um and, and and stay the course for us it's been like just like being surrounded by positive people and trying to keep out like negative energy and people saying, well, this isn't going to work and just trying to stick with like what you know can happen and trying to just stay positive with throughout like all the challenges that's for us has been the biggest challenge. I think just, yeah. What a great conversation to pop into. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. You guys are the best. Well, we got the judges coming back, so we, we had a quick conversation. Uh, I, I thought your presentations were, were awesome. Uh, in a second, I will hand it over to the uh, the judges to kind of make the analysis. But I will say, for those who have attended some of the fireside chats, my favorite question I always ask is, what is your favorite product of Rochester? And that could be a food or beverage, a place or thing. So. I'm going to make the assumption that all of you, your own product should be your favorite product. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to ask all the attendees, like in the chat, like message, you know, what, what is the most like, you know, iconic thing when you, you know, you're, you're in Rochester, what's the thing you got to eat or have? Um, and it could be a person place thing, or it doesn't have to be food and beverage. Um, and when I ask this again to the, the group, hopefully in a, you know, a month, six months from now, they're going to be saying all your guys' products. Um, so with that being said, this is very fitting because it's food and beverage. So. Um, I appreciate everyone's time. And with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Maureen and Laura to announce our winners. I would do a drum roll, but it would be too loud. Uh, so, so great job. <laughs> yeah. Great job, everyone. Um, you all did a, a great job talking about your businesses and explaining your value propositions. There was a lot of great mission-driven conversations today, and we love to see that in um, the business plans that people are putting together for the future of food that's happening in the world. So kudos to all of you on that. Um, I'm going to announce our honorable mention. We, we chose to select an honorable mention for tonight's event because it was uh, a close one for the lead. And so bold and gritty, David, we want to... Uh, Congratulate you for taking home the honorable mention prize. We love your mission for your uh, for the bold and gritty product, and especially the traction that you've been able to get in just three weeks of time is is really wonderful. So keep plugging along. Uh, we don't have a full prize pack for you because we were only supposed to name one prize, but Laura and I like breaking the rules. So. Michael said that we could uh, give you a ticket to the Startup Grind Global Conference that's happening next week. So you can enjoy that. And congratulations. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. And we look yeah, forward to trying absolutely. coffee. I love coffee. Love good coffee that you can drink black, nothing added. So look forward to hearing how we can find that. Um, and then our, uh, the winner of this pitch competition is Bandita. Um, Megan, we were really impressed with how, um, how clean your pitch was. 
you clearly have practiced and um, that's a gift and, and clearly a sign of your hard work on this. Um, we're also um, impressed by the clarity of the product that you have and the um, research that you've done to get it to this point. And we look forward to getting to yes, try it. Yes, thank you guys so soon. much. I'm so grateful. Um, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm just like a lost for words right now. But um, but yeah, hopefully spring spring's coming soon. So uh, we'll be seeing Bandita in stores. Um, yes, and congrats to everyone. I think it was it's always great learning from everyone and hearing different pitch styles and, and everything like that. Um, so thank you so much for the feedback and congrats to everyone. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. This has uh, been great. I, I will follow up with uh, the, uh, the winners with uh, getting your prize packages. But thanks everyone and I look forward to seeing everyone again soon. Thank you. So Thank great. you. See you next time. Bye. Take care. Thanks everybody.